Hello everyone and welcome to another episode of Honest to Pod, the topical podcast where each week we pitch something to ramble on about. Current events, personal growth, being a gay broadcaster, and double crowning. I'm Ashton McAllister. And I'm Matthew Alley. And this is episode 97. Seven. I'm trying to think of what, there's nothing, what is, no. I'm thinking of 180 darts, I don't know why. Yeah, what is that in? I have no idea. Seven. No. Welcome everyone and thank you for joining us for this episode. We have got another jam-packed episode full of guests, full of rugby, full of gay. So much jam-packiness in this one episode. It's it's intense. Like I've never had so much jam in one episode of the podcast. My gooch is actually sweating from how intense it is at the moment. Like, there's a little drippage going on. Um, so I, I, I nearly prolapsed. It's that jam. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so we've got um, two guests on this week. We've got the wonderful that gay rugger David Ibanez, and we have. Do you know what we talk about on the podcast? But the lovely vocal tones of Devin, but somebody else who's made their vocal tones into their career commentator Nick Heath. You'll hear about it, but he's been a broadcaster for many years and has lots of experience and hopefully he can give us a little lesson on how we can be gay broadcasters ourselves. Hmm. Yes, indeed. Yes, indeed. And then with Devin, we talk about many different topics from, well, listen and find out how about that. But um, Matt, before we jump into this sticky jam packed week, tell me quickly, what's been the best thing that happened to you this week? The best thing that's happened this week, which is one of the most scary, is I had an interview today and it was the third one and I'm one of two people left and it was just a very intense interview. So I need to find out whether I get the job or not. Um, and my problem is, and I'm doing it now, is I say it online and then I won't get it and everyone's going to be like, oh, how was it? And I was like, I didn't get it. I didn't get it. I shouldn't have said it. I did. I did. But... I was just thinking about it. It's such a stressful, stressful situation. Getting so far into something and then not getting it. It's happened to me twice already about mm. um, getting so far. And it's just very stressful. Um, one thing I did before the interview is I got like my shirt on and stuff ready to go. And then I sat in the bed and I did a little meditation um, that Drew had sent me. And it's about a little pick me up. And you know, I love a cry, bitch. I was already stressed and anxious. So I thought, let me just put it on. And it, and it says things like, um, you are worth it. And you know out external things don't value you and your past doesn't don't hold you back all, blah, 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 all these things so i had a little drip drip from my eye getting ready and then it was good because then i had like it kind of flushed out the anxiety so when the interview started i just felt really really good um so i'm hoping fingers crossed that i get the job <laughs> but if i don't it's not a reflection no it's not a reflection on me okay was it a zoom interview it was yeah it's the third one there were three people before i had two people so you uh, sat yeah. on there with your red puffy eyes after you're crying. It's not dripping down your nose. Yeah, <laughs> Hire yeah. me. Hire Give me, me a job. <laughs> give me a job. Oh, God. Yeah. I wish somebody gave me a job. I'm so fed up with this application, application. No word back, no word back. Yeah. yeah. Oh, How is your week? Over it. My week has been good. Thank you. Highlighted my week. Well, there's too many, but this one's funny because I got to take the piss out of my mom for neglecting me as a child. But, um, I've recently discovered that my hair grows in a double crown. This is amazing. And it's never been noticed because I remember when my little nephew was born, how much attention he got for having a double crown. To go to the fine age of 35 and not somebody notice it and give me the attention for it, devastated. So I've accused my mom of neglect. I'm like a feral child. You are feral. You are feral, absolutely. I've seen you open a chocolate bar. You are fucking feral. <laughs> That's true. She's just now devoured some popcorn at the weekend. Have you I, had I any? Like... Have you had any more Big Daddies? <laughs> That's good. Um, I was bought one, and I obviously had it in one go. In two sittings. On the same. That were separate. <laughs> separated, <laughs> by... <laughs> separated by a fifteen-minute toilet break. <laughs> I can't do that, boy. It's a beast. But that's a good week. I understand why you had many a highlight if you had another <laughs> big daddy in one day. Well done. Yeah. Well, I'm going through my daddy fears. I don't know what we kind of can't say on the podcast. 
Um, all right. Why don't we get into our time with our guests? So, following, we're going to have David Ibanez and Nick Heath. Enjoy! Hey everyone, welcome back. So as we just said, uh, we are joined by the lovely Devin Ibanez. And <laughs> I was worried I was going to pronounce that surname wrong. Um, Devin, you can give me a score out of 10 if you want for that. I, that's a 10. I, anything that's not somebody saying Ibanez is is a 10. <laughs> I, I, I get a lot of Ibanez because people just try to say it the way it's spelled. So you oh, did very well. Oh, well, it's, you know, it's 100% the reason what my Matt let me introduce this episode because he was <laughs> going to struggle with that name. Yes. So he thought he'd throw me under the bus. Um, so yes, we're, we're joined We're joined by Devin Ibanez, who you might have noticed on any sort of gay news outlet, for sure, as a professional rugby player who recently made the nicest little coming out story on his Instagram, um, giving a big shout out to your love, Fergus. Um, so Devin, we usually just start off with getting our guest to give a little bit of a rundown about them. So tell us about yourself. Sure. Um, so I've been playing rugby for 12 years. Um, I started in high school and I captained my high school and my university team. And then I ended up using that to go overseas. I played in New Zealand, Australia, um, England. I've kind of globetrotted all over the place doing that and eventually came back home to Boston where I signed my first professional contract and um, that's where I met Fergus as well, was back in Boston. I met my partner in 2017. Um, and ever since then, I've been back home and playing professionally. So that's kind of the background of my playing career. Other than that, I just have my full-time job, which is I work uh, doing maintenance for a nonprofit that owns a collection of group homes for adults with disabilities. So that's me in a nutshell. <laughs> well, being in America, because my understanding is that rugby isn't, the biggest of sports in america i think you've got another few sports over there that seem people seem to rave about for some reason so growing up did you did you watch rugby then in america or where would you have sort of got an interest into the sport so i i'd never i'd never watched rugby before i started playing it i had i had no <laughs> like concept or idea of what it was um i came into rugby because I failed at another sport, which was, <laughs> I, I tried to play um, baseball, which was actually one of my favorite sports to watch growing up. I used to love baseball and dead, I wanted to work sport. in baseball. Exactly. It's, it's a dead sport and it's always been kind of a boring sport, but for some reason it really captivated me. And I think part of it was my grandfather was a massive baseball fan. So this was like a connection I had with him. And so when I got to the high school, I was like, you know, I've never played baseball before and I love it so much. Like, I'm sure that naturally I'll be good at it, right? And that's not what happened. I, <laughs> I, I tried out for the freshman baseball team and I ended up being one of four players not to make the team. Um, so <laughs> it was a sobering oh, moment. Yeah, it was, it was a very sobering moment. And that's when I found rugby. I went and I looked at, you know, what, what sports are offered at the school. And that's when I found that. I, so, I, yeah, I had like a similar situation because like, I never watched rugby at all just growing up, but my friends were doing it. I wanted something to do. And I think, I don't know your experience about joining rugby team, but I felt like what really drew me in is how everybody was. They were just, they really bring you in tight and early and you feel like a part of the team quite, quite early. Was that the same experience for you? Definitely. And I think for me, as somebody who I mentioned, like I hadn't really excelled at any sports. So when you're not good at sports, you don't really get a lot of positive feedback about yeah. you playing those sports. Um, mm. So rugby did stick out for me because I had actually tried playing American football as well. Mm. And I actually quit American football um, after two months of playing because of bullying and because I would get called you know, a faggot on the daily. And it was something that people would kind of throw out and be happy to use those kinds of slurs to kind of bring me down. And when I came into rugby, it was completely the, the opposite. It was if you would make a good play, you know, they would congratulate you and they would kind of get around you. And I felt like the American football culture at our school was more about trying to one up each other and bring each other down. My, my intro into rugby was uh, just so you know, that's how Matt and I met. We met playing rugby here in London. Um, Matt used to be my captain, 
<laughs> uh, you, sound, I, you sound bitter about that. No, he was he was brilliant, Captain. I he was am an incredible bit. captain. Okay, he I is. am so good. I give like pre-game speeches that really like bring people to tears. All right, I bring tissues. Doing the emotions. Yeah, yeah. I need water to rehydrate halfway through. Just yeah, yeah. It's, um, but my my intro into rugby at school, uh, I would I think it's exactly the opposite from you two. I think um, I went. I, I played rugby when I got into secondary school and I actually hated it. And I hated, <laughs> I hated the, the captain. I won't say his name. Um, I hated the coach. I won't say his name. I just hated everything about it. I just found it such a horrible, horrible environment. Mm-hmm. Um, we went to, we went to what? It's a, it's a grammar school. So it was a very like, posh school, but it was, I, I absolutely hated it. So I then stopped playing after I, I played as much as I could or, as, a, as, much, as much as I had to, but as soon as I didn't have to play it anymore, I was out of there, like, mm. um, and then, then I then started watching it, and then when I came to London, that's when I started playing again, so. I think that part of the difference also in the cultures and, like, that kind of experience is, in the U.S., it's, it's very much an understanding of we are all beginners, right? Like, there's, mm. there's nobody on our teams who is, like, there's maybe one person who has a family member who played rugby. You know, there's not like this big, long history of successful rugby programs or players. So I think that when you go into an environment like that, there's not a lot of people who kind of look down at you. It's all kind of taken from this approach of, we all know nothing about this game. We're all just going out there and doing our best at it. So part of it was obviously probably down to the coach I had and him doing a good job, you know, creating a good environment. But I think that overall in the U.S., that is more of what you see of it being looked at as this thing of we're all in this together trying to learn at the same time. So like in your school, because um, we've spoken about this before and experiences about um, being accepted um, mm-hmm. and you've only recently come out in, in to the world, but did people know about you, your sexuality in school already or was it just something they felt they saw and would call you anyway? Um, no, I don't think anybody really knew about it in high school. I. I just kind of kept to myself. What's interesting is I was actually more open and had more friends who knew about me being gay when I was between the ages of like 12 and 13. Mm-hmm. I kind of like went, I changed schools after I was 13. And after that, I kind of just like went back into my shell. I started playing sports. And at that point, I just sort of realized like, well, I'm just going to keep this to myself because it's, you know, it's just a part of myself. I don't think, I don't consider it to be a, you know, something I have to tell everybody. And that worked for a while (laughs) until, you know, you start having relationships with people and you start realizing how much of your life you've compartmentalized and closed off from the rest of your life. So I, I don't think that it was about an assumption of my sexuality when I was in high school. I think it was just more of high school culture of that's how you belittle people, right? You compare them to being gay and that's how you tell them that they're lesser or that they're less of a man than you are. It's just, it's so interesting that we do have those different experiences because like the rugby team that I joined, we were terrible. We were (laughs) bad. And I was 19. So I just started university and they were just horrendous. I had never played rugby and I started the games. That's how bad it was. Yeah. (laughs) Um, But I think because we were such losers, they were really, really accepting of me as a person and welcoming. And I came into university thinking, I'm going to start telling people immediately that I'm gay because I came out, kind of started coming out the year, the summer between leaving um, school to starting university. Mm -hmm. So they were wonderful. They were wonderful at university. So it was really good. Oh, that's Mm. great. I'm I'm glad to hear that. I think that university, I had a bad experience of just going in there and I went there to play rugby and I was very like on it about I'm here to play rugby and I'm here to take it seriously and be good at it. But I went to a school that was very party oriented (laughs) and I think I came in with a very big chip on my shoulder. So I feel like I was very alienated rugby wise because I was the person who was, you know, in their first year university having no problem telling somebody who's in their fourth or fifth year of playing at the school, hey, you should try doing this to improve your pass. Or maybe you should <laughs> maybe you should do this in this situation, which you guys laugh because, as we know, that doesn't tend to go down very not. well in no. a team environment. So I had already alienated myself in that way. So the idea of also now alienating myself further by being like, hey, by the way, I'm also the only gay person on this team was something that I just never really felt like I could express or even bring into the picture because I had already kind of distanced myself in a lot of ways. <laughs> Am I going to be like, shh, shh, yeah. <laughs> <Nuff>. <laughs> I'm not having it. <laughs> yeah, it was a lot of that. 
Um, it's what it's funny because when I um when I then joined rugby again in London, uh, I had to say, and we we played for the uh, I don't know if you've heard of the Kings Cross Steelers. Yeah, of course, legendary yeah. teams. Well, we we that's where we met. We played for them, and to me, I always then looked at. I then compared rugby to other sports out there, and I thought that rugby was one of the, on the definitely in the forefront of pushing things forward, equality wise for mm-hmm. gay men at the time, and then just for like I guess obviously it's been rugby's been in the news for the a not so good reason recently with regards to the the ban on trans women playing. Um, do you want to do you want to give us some thoughts on that? Yeah, and that's something that. I found really devastating because like you guys said, it's, we've been seen as a sport that's really taken the forefront on being inclusive, especially for a sport that is seen as very hyper masculine and, Mm. you know, laddie in its culture. And so to see that world rugby would make a public stance in that way really hurt me because I thought about how much community I found in rugby and how it really gave me a sense of feeling like I belonged to something like you, you guys, you know, like you mentioned, Matt, about how they all kind of brought you in and you guys were all kind of losers, but you guys were all mm. in one sort of unit together. And to think about the fact that the trans community really struggles to find that community in all walks of life yeah. and found it in rugby in a beautiful way to the point where trans athletes felt like rugby was the only sport where they felt fully welcome and felt like they didn't have to question their place in the sport. Now that's been completely flipped on its head. And to think about all the people out there who are wondering if rugby is even going to be an option for them still, or if everything they've done over their career in rugby is going to be invalidated because of this ban, it's, it's really devastating. And it really upsets me, not only as a rugby player, but just as a person to think that the sporting body that represents all of us chose to represent us in this way yeah i think it's really important for us to stand up for it as well because like you know we're in a privileged position where we can actually you know we get to play the sport that we want and rugby in particular i know um you know about the steelers and your this will come out the day after so on thursday but you'll be on a panel with the harlequins which is a rugby team about how we can tackle inequality and for gay people in particular um and lesbians i feel like we're getting a lot of attention in a way that's positive which is excellent but then it's really important for us to be able to trickle down that effect and use that position to stand up for those that are still not getting you know what i believe are their rights it shouldn't even be in discussion we often talk on this podcast how it takes those not in i'm going to say the group to have a voice to sort of open up these discussions to the wider world being a professional rugby player is does this conversation happen like with your teammates at all? It's it's not anything that anybody in the men's side of the game talks about. I mean, the only, the, the sentiment from a lot of teammates I've had is just that they say, well, you know, if the women's players are all right with it, then sure, but they don't really feel comfortable weighing in because they're like, oh, well, I don't have enough knowledge on it or I'm not educated enough. I don't know the science behind it to have a stance. And it's mm. like, for me, it seems like a lot of it comes from the fact that most men's players and myself included have never played with a trans woman athlete or a trans athlete that we know personally. So I think Mm. that there's a disconnect where we feel like we're distanced from this issue saying, well, it doesn't affect somebody I know personally, so it doesn't resonate with them in the same way. So I think it's been really difficult to kind of convince men's athletes to kind of get in on the conversation and it becomes even more difficult when you have an organization like Fair Play for Women, which was allowed into the World Rugby Proceedings. For those who don't know, Fair Play for Women is basically an organization based around trying to push trans athletes out of sport and trying to say that, you know, only real women, quote unquote, should be able to play sport and that they don't consider trans athletes to be women. So a lot of it also comes from a hesitance to put yourself in a position where you're now going against what a quote unquote feminist group is saying is best for women. So now a lot of men don't feel like, well, I can't speak out against what this woman's group is saying is best for the woman's game when I'm a man and not speaking Mm. from that perspective. So it becomes a really tricky issue to try to call people in and tell them to speak up on it because the lack of education that they have going in as well as all these other factors of fear of backlash and being told that, you know, oh, well, this is just another typical man trying to speak up about women's rights and women's bodies. Yeah. It's a really tricky issue. And so I think that the only 
answer is is the better education, right? To actually take the time to say, well, this is the studies that they use to justify this ban. Can I actually go and read that study and see if what they used was actually accurate to what the study said? Or were they using pseudoscience or were they using this study as a way to marginalize the trans community even further? Because one thing I think, I, to me, rugby was always, a pro, a pro of rugby always was, was no matter what your body shape, body size, there's always a position for you on a rugby team. Yep. There's wing, wingers versus props. You couldn't get, well, back when I, we first started playing, definitely couldn't get two more different players. It is quite interesting because I, I've never even thought about that point, Devin, actually, about the fact that men might say we might. And, you know, we're three men now talking on this subject, to be <laughs> fair, which is obviously, like, ironic beyond belief. Until you have someone, I've never played with an openly trans person or someone that I was aware of as well. And... Yeah. That's also like part of, that's a result of the issue is that there's just not enough people around you to humanize this or for you to mm -hmm. feel this impetus to impact, you know, the situation. And it's just not visible enough. And I mean, I'll be completely upfront that I hadn't spoken to any trans athletes in rugby about their thoughts about the ban until recently after I came out, until I started, you know, speaking more publicly about it and the ban, I realized, well, if I want to be talking about this more, I need to actually hear from some people who have had those experiences and it, I was already really passionate about it, but then actually hearing these people who have given their entire lives to rugby, people who have played for 15 to 20 years, who now feel unwelcome in the sport and feel like everything they've done is now thrown into question, mm. even though they followed every guideline, they followed every policy. Like, if that doesn't break your heart as a rugby player who knows how much you have to put in to be a successful player, regardless of if you're trans or if you've transitioned or if you're a male or a female player, like it is a massive undertaking to play rugby for that amount of time and to commit yourself mm. to it. So that thought was something I really hadn't given the proper thought to. I really had considered obviously the fact that it was a human rights issue and that it was discriminatory and all these other horrible things. But to actually hear the human impact of it in a way that we can all relate to of losing that sense of community and being forced to question your place in the community that you felt so welcome and proud of is like, that's just, it's just awful to me. And it really upsets me that other people don't see it in that way and just see it as an issue of, oh, well, you know, it should just be up to an individual player or there should be a waiver involved or I don't know enough about it. It's like, well, then go seek out one of those athletes affected by it and talk mm. to them and listen to their experiences and see if you still feel like you shouldn't get involved. Isn't there, um, isn't there a trans man who plays in Brighton on the Brighton team? Well, there definitely was. There's a few within IGR just in general, to be fair, and there was in Brighton and... I, well, there's different rules, though. It's not about trans... It, trans men are fine, right? The yeah. rules are, you're fine, you can play, because we just assume you're going to be smaller, so therefore, you know, your body is less dense and all that stuff. You're putting yourself at risk, whereas for females, they're saying that at one point they had more testosterone and their body is built a different way, and that when they have the drugs that they need to... The hormones, it doesn't do enough to change their body. But the problem is, is that research doesn't exist fundamentally it doesn't exist mm. there's been not enough put into finding out about how any of the hormones affect your body and, and the density of, of how you perform well it's interesting mm. you mentioned about um trans men is it's actually not even really a situation of oh you're fine you can play you kind of mentioned they have to assume the risk i found this out recently that they have to sign a waiver basically saying that they're not entitled to any health coverage they're not entitled to you know benefits from rugby organizations that they're playing underneath. So they're actually not even equal in that sense because mm -hmm. they have to put themselves in a position where now if they have a catastrophic injury, they're, they've signed it all away, right? They put their name on the dotted line just to have a chance to play. So even that is another issue that needs to be talked about of, you know, is it really an equal opportunity for them to participate if we're asking them to do something that nobody else on their team is having to do, even though mm -hmm. we're all assuming risks as a rugby player? It's something that I really hope that is going to change soon. And I think that you know, like you said, it, it seems almost like accepted that as rugby players, we value this idea of inclusivity and that it's something that if you talk to somebody about rugby, it's one of the first things they'll say is that, oh, rugby is such an inclusive sport. Anybody can play at any size, like you mentioned, any level of athleticism. So I'm really just waiting for the other shoe to drop where people realize, well, if those are our values, then mm. what's happening is completely unacceptable and counter to everything that we've always said rugby values are. So that's kind of the message that I've been trying to get people to really think about and not just write it off as, you know, we don't know somebody who's being affected by it, so we're not going to think about it. I think 
as much as we sort of sort of touched on the irony of us being three men talking about this issue, um, I still think obviously that is conversation very much worth having. Yeah. Um, one of the things that we've talked about recently is the idea of having LGBT heroes and people who inspire other people from generation to generation to get involved in things. Obviously, yourself, as a gay man who's come out playing professional rugby, you're now an inspiration to thousands of gay boys and girls everywhere. How does how's that feel? I don't think it's fully set in. I mean, I, I still feel like I'm very much just like a average person who wakes up and goes to work and comes home and, you know, goes to sleep. So I don't know if I've fully appreciated the gravity of everything, but it's incredible. I mean, I, I'm so grateful for it from the perspective of to be in a position where just talking about my life experiences and talking about the things that I've been through has that kind of impact on somebody like that's something that I'm extremely grateful for. And I feel like that it's such a rare thing that I can be in that position and be so passionate about it and wanting to kind of help the LGBTQ community and make it more inclusive in sports for all of us to now be able to mix that with this experience I've had and hopefully spread that message in a way that it's meaningful for other people. Like that's been the part for me that I'm just the happiest about. I mean, I've not been able to actually see that as a possibility for myself. I think I talked about it for so long that I was going to come out and that I was going to do this thing that it mostly just seemed like an idea that could happen one day. So mm -hmm. to see now that it's actually starting to come to fruition, like I'm incredibly proud of that. And I feel like, to be able to do something like that that's meaningful with what you've done in your playing career beyond just what you went out there and the tackles you made and the passage you made, like mm. that's the dream, right? I mean, mm. to be able to take it and take it beyond. So from that perspective, like it's been incredible. Awesome. And what, what's the future hold? What, what, what's your plans? What, how are you going to use your platform moving forward? Because you're now in such an amazing position that you've got so much power. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, you're not at the same level as Honest Departs, but you got something no, to do. No, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not casually, not casually interviewing Estina Medella or anything like that, but, no, no. um, <laughs> oh, <stop. laughs> we try. Oh, my, hold on. Just before that though, you were just on um, Race Chaser with, um, Willem and Alaska, which is yeah. ridiculous. And that's a podcast I listen to. So that's, yeah. that's something there. That, sure. that is mad actually. It was it was really crazy, and that was actually a a funny experience because so I had made my coming out post on the 29th, and you know we had made the Instagram and posted the same thing, and you know it was a couple of days later, and we're starting to get a whole bunch of followers, and you know my my partner is joking with me, he's like, oh you know we're famous now, like all this other stuff. I'm like, okay, we're we're obviously we're not famous, but this is cool, and I was like, you know I'm not going to accept that I've made it until I'm followed by one of my favorite drag queens. And literally hours after we had that conversation is when Willem followed me and liked my <laughs> post. Oh, and man. that's when I DM'd Willem and was just basically did the whole fangirl thing, told Willem how much I'm a huge fan of everything that Willem does and just asked if, you know, Willem could help me get my story out there a little bit. And that's when Willem offered and asked if I would want to come on the podcast. So Willem has been amazing. And I was like, I was literally up until like 3 a.m. the night that Willem messaged me back because I was just like so excited about the chance that I might be able to go on and speak with them. What an absolute name drop. <laughs> uh, yeah. Um, uh, that's a, that's amazing. If we had known, I didn't know that you're into RuPaul's Drag Race. Um, I'm sure if we had known that at the start of this, this interview would have gone a very different way. Well, I knew it. I don't want to bring it up because then this podcast would have been two hours long. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's, that's also fair no i am i'm like a massive massive drag race fan i think i've seen every single season except for season two of thailand drag race oh so I've, yeah i've been I, yeah I, I i really i go in i go hard oh wow no um, I do, the non-english ones i haven't done because i'm lazy <laughs> but thailand looks legit thailand looks insane the holland oh, yeah. one is good i recommend you didn't watch drag race holland i tried to start watching it but it was at the time when in this country we had four series running at once i was like I i'm know. spent i am yeah. spent. <laughs> so I need a break. That's, yeah that's my partner my partner is like i i cannot do this many seasons of drag race i'm like well we're doing it so i, I was <laughs> like i was like do you want me to watch them alone and he's like 
no, I want to watch them with you. I'm like, well, then we're watching them all. Yeah, <laughs> this bad. is the position I, we're in. <laughs> I'm a I'm a recent Drag Race convert. I've sort of watched it for a while. You know, I fan. watched it. <laughs> I, I'm not I'm not not a fan. I'm really enjoying UK season yeah. two. It's a great but, season. So to me, the, the, to me, like my mom flies through TV shows. So she she messaged the other day and she's like. Usually she doesn't listen to this podcast because we talk about things that sometimes a, a boy's mother shouldn't hear. Um, <laughs> but she says, is it okay to watch the Estina one? And I'm like, yes, yes, you can watch it, Mom. And give her the warning. But um, As long as you don't mind the 15-minute conversation about poop, then you'll be, you'll be okay. <laughs> <laughs> uh, that's a conversation everyone should have. <laughs> well, you definitely is. gave visibility to that issue. <laughs> <laughs> it is. It's good. I'm an open book. I'm an open book. <laughs> Yeah, well, we all do. I went in. We all yeah, do. I went in, I went in listening and being like, "Oh, I'm going to hear some great things about Estina's experience." And it's just like, "Oh, we're we're opening up with a ten minute poop monologue." I wish up you, <laughs> De- Devin. How's your poo? Don't answer that. <laughs> um, how's it been? Si- how's your poo been since you've come out? <laughs> I had a feeling. I had a feeling this was going to go in this direction. I, just, I, shouldn't, have just said, how, I shouldn't have said anything. How regular are you? <laughs> okay i will um, say this i know we're not talking about poo but i don't know if you get the same thing before a rugby game but before a rugby game it's like my body knows it needs to get rid of any excess weight and i'm big enough as it is so before a game i could easily do like three or five before 12 o'clock <laughs> that's the thing right you must have to go a lot before you go and play a game yeah i mean that's a th- i think there's a reason why you don't use the bathroom at the field right before a match is because it's going to be backlogged by 20 players oh, all taking their pre-game shit so yes it is it is a thing it is a phenomenon and you have brought it to light and we thank you for being a stalwart and a voice for this issue <laughs> matt you you're the face of pre-rugby poo you know that's that's your i think that's, that's your racist achievement. i think that's racist uh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah don't, don't do uh, it let's move on um so, so devon what's the future hold for you what's your plans just a quick you- quick transition quick transition from poop to future <laughs> plans okay um no so in terms of what the future holds i mean obviously i'm i'm still 27 years old so i'm going to rock this rugby thing until the wheels fall off so to speak um so i've got many years still ahead playing um playing wise i think the next thing i really want to focus on is playing in the uk um oh. my partner lives in the uk and i've been in the us for Long enough, I think. It's been a few years since I got back from New Zealand and England, so I would like to go over there and play just to be closer to my partner and also to get involved with the community there. Um, another playing goal I have is I would like to also go and play at Bingham. I was at the 2018 oh. Bingham Cup, and I wasn't able to play. So I was there at 2018, and I had a broken hand because I broke my hand in the national semifinal two weeks before. And I just played in the final (laughs) with my broken hand. And I was like, you know what? Maybe I shouldn't risk surgery twice in two weeks. So I ended up sitting out. So I would love to go to Bingham and win with the World Barbarians because the Barbarians have never won a Bingham Cup. So it would be really cool to just do that with a hodgepodge group of guys. Um, We've been um, up against the – we were up against the Barbarians in Nashville. Yeah. And in Wicked, I really want to play Barbarians. I really want to play with the Barbarians, but the problem is I already play with the team. And I'm so important to my team, but they won't let me go. <laughs> such, such a good captain. Such a good captain. And just invaluable. Well, that's yeah. also what I love yeah. about the Barbarians, though, is because, and that was something that I, I struggled with with Bingham, is because I was playing for a Division One team, and I was like, well, how do I participate in Bingham without having to change my registration to a Division Three club in mm. in the Boston Ironsides in the middle of a Nationals run? Mm. I was like, you know, that's obviously not something I'm going to do. So having the World Barbarians is amazing because I feel like they really are what embodies like an inclusive rugby team. They'll literally, anybody who's like, hey, I'm a gay player or even I'm an ally and I just want to play at the Bingham Cup, like they'll take anybody and everybody. They're so, good. Yeah, mm. I, I loved it. And I'm really looking forward to actually getting a chance to play with them and not just standing on the sideline with a cast on my hand. Um, <laughs> I also am hoping to play for Team USA at the 2022 World Maccabee Games and hopefully be their captain. Um, I played with them and won the gold medal in 2017. So I'm really hoping that I can go there and you know that would be another amazing accomplishment to be their first ever openly gay captain. So awesome. I'm really focused on that. Apart from the playing though, I'm really just going full on with the advocacy and trying to be as visible as possible. I really wanna 
turn this into a career in the sense that I would love to go around and just have that be my life where I'm just going around to different clubs and doing speaking engagements and doing community outreach and grassroots coaching and just getting out there in that way. That's something that would be really meaningful to me to be able to interact with people in that way. Like, for example, I've been doing some talks with schools where I'll go and I'll do like a Zoom kind of Q&A with different classes and different students. And for me, getting to do that kind of direct interaction and just talk to students who might be going through similar things that I am or can just gain something from listening to my experiences and what I've gone through. Like that's, for me, that's amazing. And that it definitely beats doing a 40 hour a week job where you're painting and, you know, doing manual <laughs> labor. I think I would much prefer to have something like that where it's, you know, it's meaningful beyond what I'm doing with a hammer. <laughs> well, you've got, I didn't realize this actually. And I listen to podcasts at like one and a half speed because they can be long. And I tried to go through a lot of podcasts in my week and stuff. Um, but I didn't realize your voice was so deep and sexy. And so I think you'll be perfectly fine <laughs> getting people on your side to do that. Because I was like, oh shit. When you first started speaking at this podcast, I was like, oh shit. <laughs> <laughs> I, didn't, I didn't realize it was so deep <laughs> yes I, i've been told that i have dulcet tones um, yeah, boy. fergus fergus song. fergus is a fan <laughs> well, so that's the thing is i think also part of my deep voice came from that injury that i had where i fractured my throat um when that happened and i took a shoulder to the throat i also severely bruised my vocal cords so I can't like go falsetto anymore if I were to try to sing. Like I can't oh. even like I can't even do it anymore. Yeah. So I think that it did deepen my voice slightly, but I, I'm not. <laughs> I, that's that's my theory at least. I'm not. I'm not 100 sure. I think that's fact. It sounds like fact. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. It's, it's pseudoscience. We'll take yeah. it. <laughs> Thank you so so much for coming on and giving us your time and talking about everything you want to talk about. No, I mean, you know, follow me on Instagram at that yeah. Always, always. Check out, please, please check out, check out, yeah, check out yeah. the uh, website as well. I've got Twitter and I've got a uh, Facebook page. We would 100% have you on again, Devin. 100%. Oh, I'd love to do that. Definitely. I want you to prepare a song and I want the song <laughs> yeah. to be by Barry White. <laughs> Yeah. and then you can be like the intro theme to every episode that we have you know what here's here's a uh i'll give this this honest to pod exclusive this is a fun fact only honest to pod is going to get this intel um, oh here we go I, <laughs> when i was a senior in high school we used to do these little things that were like talent shows where people would go up and they'd do like an open mic where people would like sing songs that they wrote and i was a senior and i was like you know what i'm gonna i'm gonna put myself out there so i decided to do a Full on acapella version of Let's Get It On by Marvin Gaye in front of oh. my entire class. Um, it wasn't great. <laughs> it wasn't great, but it was well received. <laughs> and I, is I there video evidence? Is there there video is evidence? video evidence somewhere. Um, it was posted on like a girl's Facebook like 15 or like whatever it was, like 10 years ago. Um, I don't know if that is still out there, but you know, it is the internet. Who knows? Maybe it'll resurface one day. I think I'm my shirt might've come off at one point. <laughs> oh, stop. What's wild is you as an almost adult decided that this was a thing I should do. And you were like, Shh, nobody know I'm gay. <laughs> what, what is more straight than singing? Let's get it on it's by true. Mormon gay. That's and to, yeah. You know, amazing. <laughs> we need to find it. We need to find it. We need to find it. I'll let you guys know. I'll let you guys know, and I'll send you. Uh, I'll send you an exclusive if I get it. Yeah, it may or may not show up on Instagram. It may Maybe. or may not. <laughs> thank you, Devin. Thank you so much again. Um, have a lovely rest of your day. Have a lovely rest of your week. Um, but yeah, thank you. Well, thank you so much, and thank you guys so much for having me on. And definitely let me know in the future. I'll be happy to come on and chat with you guys again. Excellent. One hundred percent holding into that. All right. Bye-bye. Hello, everyone, and welcome back. So as we said, we've got Nick Heath of us. Hi, how are you? I'm good. I'm good. How are you? Yeah, I'm very well, thank you. I'm lucky. Hey, Nick. It's, it's got a little bit warmer as we record this out of the Arctic snap we've been in, so I... I just went for a walk without a hat and a scarf and gloves on. I mean, liberating doesn't doesn't even account for it. Did you have trousers, <laughs> shirts, and underwear on there at least? Uh, yeah, I thought I should for for society's sake. Yeah, yeah, no, that's good. You do have you always have those fools where it gets like ten degrees and like flip flops, shorts. I'm out of here. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's not me. That speaks a Northern Irishman.
I look, I look at, I look at the other people around me, and I think, like we were at Tesco's yesterday. I think we were at Tesco's, and this guy was queuing, and he had shorts on, and I was like. Are you mental? I don't think it'd be that bad to have shorts on now. You like your legs don't really get cold. I think there's yeah, like I'm sort of with you on that. So if you had like your top half covered, it'd be fine. And uh, just like and that being said, I still play rugby in leggings no matter what weather. So when we go on those tours and stuff, and we're like Nashville in 30 degree heat, I still want to have my leggings on just because I like the comfort yeah. of it. So Nick, why don't you tell us a little bit about yourself, um, who you are, what you do? Well, I'm a uh, a broadcaster uh, mainly in rugby, rugby union. And I was an attempted actor for about 10 years uh, and got to my late 20s. I kind of had a had a forgotten dream to get into to broadcasting that I'd had when I was about 18, but um, had far too much fun in my final years of school to do any decent studying for my level. So uh, so the idea of a decent university and a studying a broadcast journalism career never came off. But uh, I ran away to the circus, trained at drama school in London, uh, and then decided that uh, I would give the whole broadcasting thing a go and uh, started talking about the sport because I figured it would be the best thing for me to, to actually get my voice out there. It's synonymous with the sport that I plan to broadcast in and uh, so I started doing a podcast where no one gave a monkeys what podcasts were then basically got approached by someone who was working on uh, some rugby stuff the England rugby podcast and said oh look I, I like the interviews I've heard you doing can you come and help me with these bits and pieces and um, developed a, a reputation for doing Lots of multimedia stuff, really. I think people to, mm. to, to begin with in my rugby career, rugby broadcast career, were like, yeah, that's Nick Heath. He's the guy that sort of does the video. I think he's got a podcast, but he sort of, does he commentate? No, I think he reports. Who does he write for? It, I think I was I was of no defined box for people in the mm. industry who up until that point had been 20 years in the BBC to your job or taken on, at, uh, you know, at, at the start of, of being an intern at the Telegraph, whatever it was. Um and so I was a sort of diversifying freelancer, which I guess I've I've continued to be. But my aim was always to be commentating, and and so being behind being behind the commentary mic is is my first love and my favourite love, um, and where I've where I've gone on to spend most of my time. And and I'm busy, yeah, generally most weekends now, uh, heading off to cover Gallagher Premiership rugby games for for TV or doing women's Premier 15s matches on the live streams with uh, with England Rugby uh, and various other bits in between Heineken Cup for Channel 4 uh, I've, I've managed to work for most major broadcasters um, mm -hmm. being the media whore that I am I mean I feel like you do do a lot because I feel like even since lockdown had first happened or the whole coronavirus started that you in particular have continue to diversify your output. I don't know if there's a better way of putting it. <laughs> Maybe a little bit, yeah. I mean, there, yeah. Well, I certainly, you know, March, well, fe yeah, February, March 2020, obviously as sports started to shut down, I then, I was just bored and I was just at home and I thought, oh, well, I'll go for a walk. We weren't quite in full lockdown, but I thought I'll just go off for a stroll and up to the common and have a wander around. And I just saw a couple of guys hopelessly kicking a football around and thought, well, maybe I'll just, <laughs> just do some little commentary on the side just to amuse myself. And ultimately I thought I'd send it to a few mates, but I had, you know, my rugby following or my following on Twitter was about 15,000 at that point. And I thought, well, I'll, you know, it might just be a bit of fun, a bit of lighthearted thing to do on a Tuesday afternoon. And then as I was walking around the common, I spotted another couple of things that I thought I could do. So I did that for a bit of fun. And then the next day I had people messaging me going, I think Greg James has just played you out on Radio One. And I was like, what? And he was just like, yeah, so as we know, sport's being cancelled. And so, uh, the, you know, some commentators are having to come up with new ways of finding sport. And all of a sudden, there were four clips that I'd done that were played out on Radio 1. And then within two or three days, they played it on Radio 2, on 5 Live, and Radio 4. I just, I basically, if I'd have turned it into a classical piece of music, I'd have been on Radio 3 as well. Yeah, I was on all of them and then started to appear on CNN and, and Australia and all sorts of mad programmes. And then I did, then I was with Phil and Holly on This Morning. Uh, ah. They played played one of the clips on uh, "Have I Got News for You." It was it was absolutely mental. Uh, and my social media following, I mean, on Twitter, it went up to something like one hundred and twenty five thousand people, which was nuts. I That's think in the, inter in the intervening time since I've gone back to actually working on rugby, I think a good ten twenty thousand people have gone. Oh, really? Not no more of the funny, <laughs> stupid stuff. This is not for me. Thank you. Uh, I, don't, yeah, yeah. I don't I don't care who's the starting prop for London Irish this weekend. I want you to commentate on a dog running around the corner. Um, so uh, so yeah, so I've I've lost a few I think since then but um yeah it was a really interesting lesson in terms of I don't know allowing myself to bring a bit more of my personality to what I did because a lot of sport is very straight and I, I don't mean that in a sexuality way but you know the mm -hmm. 
it's it's just very serious and and there are livelihoods at stake and athletes who train all the time and and professional sport and uh, i was getting messages having done the live commentary clips from sort of a lot of american housewives it seemed who were just going oh it's, <laughs> it's normally my husband who watches the game but um if this is what sport's like you know count me in <laughs> um, and, and i kind of thought why isn't sport more fun? Why isn't it more like this? It was a nice little lesson to learn. And actually, I've tried to filter that back in since since sort of rugby returned and and in any conversations I'm having with broadcasters to say, look, I'm I'm gonna have a bit of fun with this this afternoon, if you don't mind. And they're like, Oh yeah, fine, go for it. But I just think it it actually makes a difference because if you're sat at home with a cup of tea and it's a yeah, okay, it's an average game, there are a few tries being scored, but actually if you're if you're starting to go, you know, certainly with crowds in, you know, well, chap in the corner over there, he's arrived with another four pint jug. We're going to see how long it takes him to get rid of that amongst his mates. Anyway, the tribe was scored by, you know, mm. just what else can you bring to it that's just going to make mm. it seem a little bit more fun and lighthearted? And, and I think that's that's kind of my my raison d'etre, my mission at the minute is to is to is to keep the fun in broadcasting rather than it be too serious. Yeah. I think the world is so serious at the minute as well. Like everyone takes everything too so seriously. We need to add so much fun to stuff. Like I was just saying, I think I can remember when we said, was it last week we recorded and it was after the Ireland game and uh, Billy Burns, I said, yeah, yeah, he missed the kick. The coals, yeah. Literally, like, on, I was on the Facebook group not even two minutes after the game and it, like, people were slaughtering him. I was like, what? It, don't take it so seriously. Like, I guess people are passionate, but like, give the kid a break. Yeah, no one's allowed to make a mistake, you know, come on. No, 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 no. You know, like the live commentary thing, I don't know if you thought maybe you were putting on a bit more of a voice but i was like i'm pretty certain that's exactly how you speak all the time the worry for me is that people do think that that's how i was speaking all the time <laughs> it was, but it was an interesting one because when i first started broadcasting i i came out of doing years of kind of either acting stuff or or promo work or different bits and pieces and and i was also trying to write comedy with friends of mine and come up with scripts and, and screenplays and stuff and and actually, one of the things I liked doing was playing PlayStation and doing my own version of commentary over the top. But it was always a really tongue in cheek, uh, back of the throat sort of Barry Davis, David Coleman style. You know, that very much silly. Well, hello and welcome. And how are we doing this afternoon? And uh, when I actually came to broadcast properly, professionally, um, it took me quite a while to get rid of the kind of parody voice I'd been doing for mm. years, um, which I was slightly worried, slightly worried about. It took me a long time to find my own voice. Probably, I think I started commentating and reporting in around 2010, 11, and I wouldn't say my voice settled into something that I was happy with until about 2014. So there was always that sort of still slight, slight back of the throat tone when something was happening. <laughs> oh, and it's a good try. But then you're sort of still doing that slightly Kermit the Frog voice, which is just yeah. all about... Um, and so it took a while to get that out. And then sort of bizarrely then the whole thing that ends up taking off is when I revert to doing it for a bit of a giggle and it then is this sort of absurd uh yeah parody commentary character which uh thanks Matt for assuming was just my normal voice but um <laughs> yeah, assuming is, I've is heard you thing. speak <laughs> yeah um but is is that kind of thing where I, I love the idea of the character because he's just excited wherever he is and he's, he's excited wherever he is and he's successful and he's very good at what he does and oh my goodness how quickly can we hang the washing out oh the time has started now mm. whatever it might be he's you know the the, the voice and that character is is ready to be there but yeah i am it, it, it's never felt more important certainly coming off the back of of doing all of that stuff and it going viral to when rugby started for me to kind of make sure my opening tones <laughs> of my first game weren't well hello and welcome to sandy park uh so, oh no it's just like let's Let's try and go with the far more voiceovery type thing, even if that's maybe a bit further back from where I should have been, mm. just to differentiate the two. It's uh, something we have to kind of work through. I think I would say it's actually now, you know, like we mm -hmm. sometimes listen to back to what we're doing. And I remember the first few episodes, like we said, you know, we've been doing this for such a long time. Um, but I hadn't really heard of a podcast. I'm surprised they were back in 20, like 2007, because I'd never even heard of a podcast really until like just before we did this. And I mm. was going to do it. So I was like, okay, let me listen to some podcasts. Let me listen to some gay podcasts because I want to sound just like them. And so the first few episodes, I'm like definitely not who I am or how I speak. And this mm. is really like heavily Americanized. And it wasn't an accent, but like just like just not really natural to who I am because I was trying to be this like personality. Do you know what I mean? And it wasn't like natural to, to me speaking yeah. like from some from London or whatever. Interesting that you felt a need at that point to go, okay, what do they sound like? Let me sound like them, rather than to go, okay, that's what they sound like. So I so so let's, you know, let me be me. You know, and I've got such a wonderful personality. I don't even know why I would think that. Do you, yeah, you do. You bring you bring so much energy anyway. I don't know why you don't like waste energy on trying to 
pretend to be somebody who's already there. And also you've got you've got, you know, a, a unique London centric voice as well, which certainly isn't something that is represented across a ton of podcasts anyway. So yeah, I agree. It's your Oh my god, I didn't expect voice this. Is, Oh, natural <laughs> <personality>. <laughs> Thank you. I didn't. I thought you were going to take the piss, but okay, yeah. Um, I don't think so I mean, sound. <laughs> I don't think I sound that London though. But do you reckon I sound really London? Not that bad. Did then? Well, well, I don't know what you're thinking. Really, London is. So, yeah. um, why why rugby? Well, I was brought up in a very rugby family, um, very kind of middle class home counties, South Buckinghamshire schooling. And my dad had been a referee in Bucks for, for 25 years. Uh, it was in the blood. My uh, my late Irish mother and her family over in Ireland were all all rugby fans. Um, and it was nice then, you know, for, for my dad, who's now in his late 70s, and to, for him to have kind of enjoyed the last 10 years. And I mean, he still sort of has moments when he goes, what, you're doing that? You're doing a men's game? This, what, which one? Georgia against Russia, dad. Oh, that must. Is that the first international you've done? No, my first international <laughs> was nine nine years ago. But thanks, you know. Um, so he's proud, but he doesn't mm. keep up with the detail. But that's fine. <laughs> I guess that's the same for us, because like you know, I've definitely I'm a casual watcher because mostly because I don't have the sports channel, so it's really difficult for me to follow like the in and out mm. week on week rugby. So Six Nations, you know, now is mm. pretty much my only source of rugby watching. Um, and internationals in particular. So if you don't know of the six teams or the World Cup, then it's quite often missed. It's very frustrating, I think, that rugby is on so many different channels. You literally have to have about eight different subscriptions these days. I, like one thing that uh, I'm not, I don't like doing rugby football bashing because I think it's just really passe and done. But one thing that really frustrates me about football broadcasting is this phrase. I mean, it's to do with how the sport's played ultimately, but you hear people going, he had the right to go down there. Oh yes, there was there was contact. He had the right to go down. It must be a foul or a penalty. It's just like, mm. Mm. Either he was knocked over and, and kicked down, in which case it's foul, or he was fouled and he didn't fall over, but it's still a foul. But this whole yeah. idea, he had a right to go down there because there was contact. So he, so we're all giving him permission to cheat here because mm-hmm. it, there was a legitimate reason that he could have conned the referee and therefore got an advantage for his team. That, for me, is old bollocks. Um, so uh, I'm I'm not standing for that. So I just I knew I could never really do a sport where I'd be like, oh, hey, he's just fallen over. I mean, <laughs> yeah. That's not that's not the game. It's not because in football that's probably a foul. Why mm. he's just fallen over? So no, not not for me, Jim. <laughs> I've got two questions about sort of the Georgia and the Russia thing because you did the game just the other day and you posted a video about the names. How did that go? Did you get the names right? Yeah, I think so. I think I tripped over one of them once. Um, the Lobzhenitsy and Abzhendadze and and and. Mama Kushvili and whoever else we had um, was all good fun. But yeah, it is a fun challenge. But then the, those sorts of names, although there's a lot of consonants and, and syllables in them, are fine. The, the worst ones I find are actually South Africa. Afrikaans names, oh, are just a nightmare. I don't know what I'm saying. It's got three O's in it and a couple of K's and and his name's Yurk or something that sounds like <laughs> I've been sick. Um, it's, uh, it, it's, yeah, it's a difficult one, that. Um, no disrespect to people who are Afrikaans, but, um, but yeah, so there, there are certain, there are some languages like Japanese and like, like perhaps Georgian that look like they're going to be a nightmare, but actually it's pretty obvious once you see it written down, but yeah. um, the, the nuance of, of South African and, Afri- and Afrikaans names always, I always trip up. I think that would be the same for a lot of like British names or maybe English in particular where because we don't seem to spell things the way that they're said. At least with some other countries, you know, they're spelt the way that they're said. You just need to read the words. Yeah. Phonetically, yeah. 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 The old, the old Celtics always want to trouble you as well with their with their delightful, you know, Neve, N I A M H. What? Mm, in terms of the Six Nations. And then there's Georgia and Russia and then, say, Italy, for example, who a lot of people don't think should be involved and there should be some sort of um, promotion and relegation in in and out of Six Nations. Do you think there should or shouldn't be? What are your thoughts on it? I think promotion and relegation as a a broad concept in any sport is good because it it maintains that level of competition and interest and and jeopardy, which I think fans kind of like. I'm not entirely sure it's needed in the Six Nations. Um, I think the competition is so strong with such a heritage and history behind it that I don't think it needs any of that to be brought in to make people any more or less excited about it. Um, and I was I, I commentated on Georgia against Italy 
uh, a couple of years ago when it was being billed as the big kind of Six Nations showdown. You're like, ah, Georgia's chance to show that they can match Italy and and should be considered for the Six Nations. And Italy, Italy won pretty comfortably, but I don't think there's anyone who's close to challenging yet, really. I think there are five five nations, then a gap to Italy, who are sort of almost on their own, and then a gap to the rest of the teams in Europe, the the, the Georgians and and Belgians and Germans and everybody else. The key, the key issue for any of these teams is they're not given enough opponent, enough time against good opposition. I was fortunate enough to work with the USA team in in Japan during the World Cup and just chatting to them and and finding out, you know, when they when they were meeting England, it's the only, or rather, they've not met outside a World Cup, and you just think that's mad for two international teams in the history of the game for them not to have ever put on a game at Twickenham or and it's because it's it's all the money men going well if we bring Australia South Africa and New Zealand over we'll sell out Twickenham we'll make a load of money um, and that's all that matters the visiting team don't get a single penny of that either which is also mad um, so you know they they should be inviting that I, I appreciate that every union has a duty to be profitable but I think almost related to the full laws not laws um, full values of the game then actually you should be playing some of these tier two or less experienced countries. Mm. You should be sharing the gate receipt so that they get some investment back in their union and they will be, be they will be better for it as a result. But no matter, no matter how you look at it, it's an old boys network and an old boys game and, and, and they'll look after themselves and sort everyone else, which, uh, you know, you know, no matter how you look at it and how things have changed over the years, ultimately still remains as the status quo. It's mm. kind of sad, but it's kind of true. It's quite difficult because I guess in some ways, like, and we'll talk about it in a bit, like rugby is progressive in many different ways when it comes to like society and stuff like that. And we're talking about, you know, ourselves being gay men within a rugby atmosphere. But then in other ways, it's not because they could think of more inventive ways to include other teams to make it across the board. But I don't know how it might benefit them. There is, but you're right. There's definitely a part within the whole topic of inclusivity and the supposed fairness and values that rugby wants to have and we don't cheat and we all shake hands at the end of the game and aren't we lovely and considerate to each other um that that doesn't stack up really um in terms of actually how the game conducts itself how the major powers use their power to ultimately always get what they want certainly when when you're looking at, at the more directly relevant stuff as as you know as as members of the lgbt community and yeah, it's it's magic. I was actually having a chat um, this morning with the Women's Sport Alliance, and they were talking to me about the amount I do in the women's game, and I was saying, well, look, I I think I have an affinity towards the women's game because I'm I'm already in a minority as a gay man, and I can see what you have to deal with as the lesser favoured side of the game, albeit the the most growing, mo- mo- you know. Um, growing and developing side of rugby that there is at the minute because so many people are falling out of the men's amateur game. And, and actually I like the product. I like working on it. I like the people in it. Everyone's trying to pull in the same direction. They're all working just as hard as the men. It just so happens they're they've not been doing it as long. So they're not quite as Mm. good. So they're not going to get paid for it, but that day will come. But actually the, the sense that I, I feel as, as someone who, has been looked after by the sport i was asked you know have you have you ever found a negative reaction have you know being an out broadcaster being an out commentator from the sport and i i I feel pretty lucky to say i haven't really i think the only time occasionally is if if something comes out about israel falau and i decide to to tweet negatively and someone replies to me and goes are you gonna let it go i'm like no no i'm never going to let it go (laughs) No. If he's going to continue to put his religious beliefs out there in massive memes on Instagram and tell people that homosexuals deserve to go to hell, uh, then uh, then I shall equally speak up and uh, and suggest that he shouldn't really be playing rugby anywhere where he's going to be that much of a reckless role model that could lead to kids taking their own lives. Was it, Matt, were you saying that he, he potentially might be signing for somewhere in Europe? Did you tell me in- that? Uh, so like the Catalan Dragons, whatever, isn't he signed up to another one? And he's even so I didn't realize this, and that he actually won his appeal against the Australian um, Rugby Authority, multi million. He won a multi million dollar or you know settlement, and then he just joined a team because Nick, you actually reposted it on your Twitter, isn't it, about the text messages that he received from some of his players, um, yeah. or our player, our player in particular. They, they they were putting gay porn in the in the team WhatsApp group once he joined the team, um, which mm. I just think is is hilarious. Um, well, in the Catalan team, uh, yeah, I think it was, um, <laughs> or, in the, or in the other team he joined. I can't quite remember, um, but yeah, uh, 
and it's so sad because he ultimately has been one of the greatest players in the in the world mm. game in, in the last in the last 10 15 years and it would be lovely to see him playing his game without all the baggage that goes with it and I, I, I know that there are people out there that sort of say, oh, well, you know, you're gay and you don't have to ram it down everyone's throats and, you know, but but he's choosing to just say what he likes and and all those sides of those arguments. But it, it only ever comes down to, for me, well, do you, do you need to really force that view that you have publicly when it could be harmful to other people? And I think as soon as you're choosing to do that, un, un, uninvited, mm. that just makes you not a very nice person. Um, mm. and, I actually... Uh, I actually feel a little bit differently to you in that respect, actually. Do I do. I do. Because only because I would say that someone in his position, for example, or some people that might respond, you know, rugby is an old school sport and a lot of sports are very white, older men, whatever it is. Right. And so they may have views that say that the things that we're saying is damaging to their children. That might be their opinion. Right. Mm. So they might genuinely and we don't believe, say, that it's damaging. And we got out of our way and Harley Quinn's got out of their way and we'll talk about them, about the steps that they take. They may say that is damaging. I think that Israel Folau and anyone should have the opportunity, given their platform, to say whatever they want to say, if they don't believe that they're intentionally harming people. I don't know whether he does or doesn't. However, I think everybody who opens their mouth should have the opportunity to... They need to face their own consequences, right? That's what needs to happen. So I think that everybody should be able to express how they feel. And Donald Trump allowed people to say they wanted to say. He feels the need to say what he wants to say. That's That I don't have a problem with. Say what you want to say. Fuck you. Right. That's I don't believe that. But whatever. That's what you believe. But I do think there needs to be consequences of people's actions. And I don't because we can't say that he shouldn't say what he believes, but then we should. I don't believe that. Yeah, I think you're, that's a very fair point. And, and I guess I guess how much of it is how much of a platform I would be using to to say what I want to say or, or have an opinion. I guess I guess there's one thing to be celebrating the positivity of your community and there's another thing to be putting something out there that that is you know negative and and ultimately hurtful or or could be causing pain to someone else and so Mm -hmm. i don't i don't believe that anything that i'm putting out there as an lgbt man talking about my work and i'm not defending myself against your argument but i just think i I, I'm, i'm exploring it in my head as i speak but i think i think i'm i'm representing what i what what i feel and 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 practicing what i preach i guess but I'm representing the values that I hold and what what I think is worth celebrating, but I don't think there's a danger that that's doing harm to someone. I'd be interested to an argument that someone might think it is, but yeah, it's uh, yeah, it's an interesting one. I, I'm 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 with I'm with you, Nick. Um, in my like, if my, if we're out there saying stuff, say for example, we're saying whatever. In my head, as long as we're not saying anything that's pushing any sort of boundary, that you know, if we're looking at maybe gay versus straight, that somebody who is in the same position as straight isn't saying. So for a, a good example, which is, you know, came recently is the, the article in, I can't remember who, what article it was, but she, this same woman wrote an article about the sex scenes in Bridgerton and called them raunchy and spicy. And, and then there was the sex scenes and it's a sin and that was over the top. It was too much. And it's like, mm. well, wait a minute. That's, you look to me that they should be viewed equally, yeah. you know? And I think in this opinion where we're talking about, well, it, you're right, you know, people should be able to say what they want, but they should have consequences. But what you're saying, Nick, is if, if somebody's out there and they're, they, they're, they're choosing to say negative things that are potentially hurtful, the equivalent to me would be is if, if we're out there as, you know, if I was out there as a gay man saying, your religion is a f- stupid, don't be religious, that's, you know, you, you're, you know whatever it might be, whatever, I'm not, I don't think like that, but I, it's hard for me even think in the spot of something negative to say to somebody who's religious. Mm. that that's the equivalent and i would say to somebody who you know who doesn't believe in religion doesn't believe in faith it's like, well, it's not your place to say that you know as similar as i would say to israel Folau, it's not your place to say that you can't say that let mm. these people live their life i would never say that i would never say to a christian don't have your faith don't go to don't go to church on sunday um and that's to me that that's to me the balance mm. yeah i i think it, it's that element of you know you do you need to do you need to promote so much what you believe and, and what what you're into to such a point that it started to be negative about other people around you and yeah. and so you know uh, I'm 
as, as a gay man, I love kissing men and all those people out there, if you don't kiss men, well, then you're entirely wrong. And it's just, yeah. no, you, you, I'm fine with you going on about kissing men. That's not a problem. But the idea that you're now saying that I'm in the wrong for not doing so, I'm going to have a problem with. And, and yeah. I think I think that's that's where I'm at with Falao. I, 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 no point did I say, and I do not want to get this misinterpreted, that I agree with anything that Israel Flower done. No, I was no, talking no, about no. free <laughs> speech as a whole. My interpretation of free speech was what I was getting at. I just want to just put that out there because I'm yeah. not saying he should or shouldn't. I'm just saying that anybody should feel the need to do. But I agree with what you're saying, Nick, about that there's a negative spin on it. You're either promoting love or hate. And his words are saying, you you are wrong if you do this, you're wrong if you do that. And what we're saying yeah. as a community is we want you to love whoever you love. We want you to have the most positive experience you can. And I take mm. your point that, yeah, it's about facing the consequences and you can, you know, people should be entitled to be able to say whatever they want to say. But if you're going to call everyone a I don't know how much language we can use, but I'll... All of it, please. All of the language. Where are we? <laughs> please, please do. <laughs> well, if well, if you're going to call someone a cunt, then you're going to have to deal with the consequences. And, and you know, yeah. In, yeah. In, in, in some way, that's what, what he did in that. But anyway, he's had too much airtime already. So we I can... know, mm. I know. Well, why don't we talk <laughs> about... So um, Harlequin seems to be quite on top or ahead of the curve in terms of rugby in particular. Um, and you oh, are no. a ambassador, isn't it, for the Harlequins Foundations? What is that? Yeah, I am. I was approached uh, in summer last year by um, by Mark, who runs the foundation. Um, excuse me, and uh, and he said he said, right, your your newfound viral fame is undermining the approach I'm making here because I was planning to approach you about this a while ago, and and now it looks like I'm doing it because you're famous. Um, <laughs> and, uh, Mark's this fabulous, he's one of the campus straight men I've ever had the pleasure to deal with. And uh, he's, he's an excellent man from Northern Ireland himself. Um, and he was just like, he was just like, oh, it's so annoying that you ended up famous when I was going to try and talk to you before anyway. Um, but <laughs> um, apologies, Ash, for my terrible Northern Irish accent. But, it's fine. Um, I hear it all but, the time. But, <laughs> yeah. So the foundation is about using rugby for good and reaching out into the community. Um, Harlequins being based in London means that they can also do a lot of kind of urban outreach to places that rugby might not touch. Um, and and to do good and to uh, to take people perhaps from deprived backgrounds and afford them more opportunities and and James at the club James Swanson who was the real driving force suggested to Quinns they could do more to reach out to the LGBT community and so then he put the wheels in motion for the Pride match um, and arranged the panel. And then we're doing a webinar. We're doing a few webinars over the next couple of months together. And uh, and yeah, Quinn's announcing this week, as, as we record, that they're going to be the first professional rugby club to have an LGBTQ plus supporters association. And even if it means that there are only, there are only seven gays and lesers at Harlequins going, out, isn't it nice? We've got our own little club, <laughs> which I don't think it will just be. But even if that's what it is, and it's making them feel more secure and celebrated and part of the club, than I don't know any reason to not feel that. Then I think that's a lovely thing, um, and clearly it'll it'll end up being a bit more than that. One thing that we all want to see is more out players in sport, and I think if clubs start showing a bit more of a more public support towards the LGBTQ community, then you know it it may be a long way off, or not that long way off, but hopefully more and more players will come out. And actually, I was having a conversation with Paul Gustard, who was the director of rugby at Harlequins, who, uh, who's only recently left, but actually we started a conversation towards the end of last summer. Well, and this is, I think, a really interesting issue in sport right now, um, or just generally, but I said, I said, how well-equipped do you feel to cope with or provide the right, right environment for a 19-year-old guy or a 17-year-old guy in your academy who wants to come out or at least feel more comfortable within himself by telling you or, or the club. And he was like, oh, well, you know, me and my wife have got many good friends and my, my office door is always open. So I'd always want to feel that, that anybody could come and express themselves. I'm not going to judge them. And I, I hope we've got a squad of players here that, that wouldn't judge them. And so, yeah, it wouldn't be a problem. And then he sort of paused and he went, and he's a, he's a, he's a coaching noise. He loves being, being on top of everything. And he went, but to be honest, Nick, I have to say, you've exposed a weakness in my coaching there. I don't know that I'm doing enough to provide that moment and that opportunity. Um, I'd be interested to work with you on how we could improve that. Um, and, and so it's something that I'm, I'm kind of, it's a bit of a long game thing, but I'm trying to work on is actually probably post COVID when we're allowed to actually go and, and be in clubs and stuff, but actually is to go in and do some education pieces, maybe working with a couple of people, Lou Engelfield at Out Sports perhaps, or Pride Sports, sorry. Um, and actually to go into some of these clubs and say, okay, can we do a session with the coach and your assistant coaches about how you 
provide this environment. We'll talk to the squad about the importance of language um, and the, using the right thing. And, and actually to be able to potentially do a, a pattern of things across 12 or 13 premiership clubs mm-hmm. and get them to a point where they've all had a massive education piece on, on how to, how to provide this, this improved atmosphere for LGBTQ plus people that sees if one person feels more comfortable and able to say something and it means that they're a better rugby player or a better player in life as a result, then it will be a really good job done. The other interesting thing is I I sort of, like, I I find it interesting how much your, like the LGBT community, I don't think, uh, progress is an interesting thing, I think, because we could progress to being accepted and like acceptance and tolerance are two big part, two big words in the LGBT plus movement throw in the cue which I always forget but I, I love is love everybody um, but I think you know people are prepared for me to be uh, a gay commentator that's fine but the idea that you know okay you're an LGBT broadcaster but I'm a, and I'm okay with that it's just like yeah and scrum halves are my thing oh I didn't oh I don't want to hear that you know it's uh, I there's there's an interesting next stage I think with it not just you know I'm not talking about me and sport but actually when the LGBTQ plus community are allowed to talk with a little more license about what they like or don't like, mm. which we've which we've never been really entitled to do in the public domain because we're just allowed to get as far as saying what we are and be tolerated and accepted. Yeah. And then if you can go and have your party in that bar over there with the doors closed, we'd, we'd appreciate it. Thanks. Yeah. No, I agree. Because even with um, all these initiatives that are happening, and we have at our rugby club, I mean, you're hosting a panel with our chairman from the Kingsville Steelers on Wednesday, and this will come out the day after. Um, and I'm interested to find out because as gay men, and I would say in particular for you both as well as white gay men, I, I do think there's a certain level of allowance that you might have, right? It's it's not unsurprising that, say, your experience as a an out broadcaster hasn't been marred by many much negativity, you know, unless there are other things, because you can pass as, or you're accepted to, you will fit in in that situation, for example. Mm-hmm. And I think as a gay man myself, although I am black and I have some other... Um, you know, I don't want to say disadvantages, but different challenges, whatever, I still have a certain level of um, acceptability within a wider community. Um, but, and Maggie Alfonsi, she even posted, she's now commentating with, and you look at the, the panels for um, the Six Nations and it's like uh, uh, Gabby Logan, Maggie Alfonsi, Gareth Thomas. And I was like, shit, what? Mm. Like this, things have changed a lot, but she's still getting a lot of abuse just for being a woman and then a black woman because they're still not acceptable. They're not allowed. And I think it's up for us to stand up for not just that, but there's a whole queer aspect that's not even addressed. We talk about transgender players, people who don't identify with any gender or gender fluid. And we're on like the accepted end of it. So I think there's a lot that we need to do. I think I feel like I, I've never felt more like I need, and I don't know whether this is just the age I've got to or the, or the sort of roles I'm, I'm playing in things like webinars like this, but I've never felt a need to educate myself more about what's going on within the LGBT community rather than trying to help people outside of it understand us. Does that make sense? Mm. Yeah, because it's so diverse now and there's so much to it that we don't even understand. Our experiences are all different. Just because we're gay yeah. men doesn't mean we understand even bisexuals and um, transgender and non-binary. So I think there's so much. Yeah, my one of my best mates, Vicky, said to me I mean, about two, three years ago, she was like, OK, so I've heard a conversation and you're going to have to know about these things because it's going to start coming up. I was like, what are you on about? And she was like, so you're a cisgender man. I was like, am I? I had never heard the impression. <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> and, and, you know, and I'm a cisgender woman. Right. OK, now you're a cisgender gay man. Yes. Okay. And I'm, a, and you know, people from the trans community will may say that you're quite close-minded because you are naturally going for us. And th- these various discussions around gender, sexuality, uh, cis status, all this kind of thing that absolutely blew my mind. And and I sort of I worryingly can admit that I feel like at some point in the next five to twenty years, there's going to be a moment where I go, I don't really understand it, but as long as you're happy, it's fine. And yeah, sudden, um... I'm going to be I'm going to be giving some parental, you know, some previous generation of mine response to something that I don't necessarily understand. And I, 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 I a bit like developing technology. I don't want to get to a point where I've lost touch in that way. <laughs> Nick, thank you very much for coming on. I was just saying, uh, Nick, good luck with um, everything and good luck with the Harlequins uh, LGBT thing as well, because that sounds absolutely amazing. Um, Thank you very much. 
yeah well it's been been lovely to be on and clearly we've we've brushed across a couple of topics but clearly could have talked for an awful lot lot longer so um so much that. longer yeah well have a lovely day and um yeah we'll speak to you soon thank you thanks guys. nick lovely to be here cheers bye-bye Bye. oh my god beautiful oh my god is beautiful Oh my God, oh my God, this feeling can be a... Oh, such a good song. Um, mm. Do you know this song? No. Oh, it was number one recently. m and K and something Corey, I think his name is. It's... Huh? Oh, I was going to say, what a wonderful episode. Brilliant episode. Thank you very much for our lovely guests for coming on and joining. Um, giving up the time. Um, watch out for Monday when we have our segment for episode 97, which is movies with Matt. Yeah. Well, it's going to be along the same themes as Tay, which is um, gay rugby. Yeah, no, we can say it. it's just all the same. It's, it's gay, yeah. Okay, cool. Yeah, yeah. It's, um, it's yeah, gay, so it's, it's rugby. Yeah, yeah. And it's Irish, so they definitely lose. Um... <laughs> <Ooh>. <laughs> yeah, perfect. So thank you very much for listening, guys. Watch out for Monday for our lovely segment and have a lovely weekend. Have the best weekend ever. Draw you lovers. Bye. Bye.